Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're having a fantastic day so far and in today's video I'm going to be tackling a topic that I'm frequently asked about by people just starting out with watercolors and this is water control. Now water control is a huge topic and this skill is probably the most important for you to start developing as a beginner just starting out with this painting medium. And at the same time, it's one of the most difficult things to explain, I feel. And a couple of reasons why this is, is because not only are there so many different ways to do things when it comes to watercolor, depending on the effects you're intending to create, but with watercolor, there are also tons of different variables involved that can change the way the painting process goes for us, as well as the final outcome. Some of these variables include the type of paper that we're using, the type of paint that we're using, and more specifically, the pigment on hand that we're using, because different pigments react differently even within the same paint set. Also, the paint brushes that we're using and even the temperature of the room that we're working in affects our working process and the final results. Not to mention, as we are creating a watercolor painting, we are constantly shifting the ratio of water and or pigment in our paintbrush bristles, on our paper, and in our paint mixtures, depending on the area or layer that we're currently painting. Even though there is no straightforward answer or instructions for me to give you in regards to water control, this video is going to be full of useful tips and exercises that you can start practicing so that your watercolor paintings have much more of a chance of going the way you want them to. So to begin, I'm going to be explaining three kind of overarching characteristics in regards to watercolors that you should definitely understand. And after that, I'm going to be sharing specific tips that are going to help you have more control when it comes to the amount of water and or pigment in your paint mixtures, on your paper, and in the bristles of your paintbrush. Because throughout your painting process, you should definitely practice staying mindful of how much water and or pigment is in each of these three things. I'm going to be leaving a timestamp for you down below in the description box in case you want to skip the first part and jump straight to the tips. However, if you're just getting started with watercolor, then it's very, very important for you to understand these first three things. Real quick before we begin, I just want to send out a huge welcome to all you new people just visiting my channel today for the very first time. I'm super happy you're here. Consider subscribing because every single Friday I share a new video with art tips, drawing and painting tutorials, and encouragement for aspiring artists. And if you do subscribe, do not forget to click on that little notification bell so that YouTube can let you know whenever I publish a new video. Otherwise, you may or may not find out about it. All right, so the very first thing that is very important to have in mind at all times and that I wish I knew as a beginner just starting out with watercolor is that pigment or paint is always going to expand or blur out on wet paper. And these kinds of effects are beautiful for backgrounds, the first layers of a painting, or other areas where you may want blurred out effects. These kinds of flowy wet-on-wet -wet effects are what attracts many people to watercolors in the first place. And though one of the beauties of watercolor is that it tends to have a mind of its own and up to a certain extent, you have to allow it to do its own thing. It's very useful to have a general idea of what is going to happen so that you can at least have some level of control over the outcome. And if you're looking to create sharp lines or little details that don't blur out, it's very important that you apply your paint on paper that is completely 100% dry. The second thing that is huge for you to know about as a beginner just starting out is that when we use watercolor, we can create a very large variety of values from the very darkest version of the color to the lightest version of the color using only one pigment. As opposed to other painting mediums like oils and acrylics, we don't really need black or white or any other color that we may need to lighten or darken a color. With watercolor, we create lighter versions of the color by simply adding more water to our paint mixtures. 
This is not to say that you can't bring in a second color that is going to darken your color later on when you're trying to work on darker values. I often do this in my own work because once I have achieved those initial values using only one paint color, I really love upping the contrast and adding in a second color that I add into my color mixture that is going to help me darken those values wherever needed. Another thing that I love doing in order to really make my paintings look nice and contrasting, because I know that watercolor tends to dry lighter than how it looks when it's wet, I like coming back to it one hour, two hours later to see if I have to further darken certain areas. All this said, depending on the pigment and your paint quality, you're probably going to be able to create a very large variety of values using only one pigment. And the way that you do this is you basically modify the ratio of pigment to water in your color mixtures. So essentially, more pigment plus less water equals darker, more saturated values. On the other hand, more water plus less pigment equals lighter values and more transparent color. And the third thing that I really wish I knew as a beginner just starting out is that most quote unquote finalized paintings, like for example, a landscape or when you're looking to paint something complex that is composed out of a background, a middle ground and a foreground, those kind of paintings are going to require us to do at the very least a bit of planning so that we have at least a general idea of how we're going to be approaching these layers and what sequence we're going to be working in. Because as I mentioned before in the first point, if we're looking to create blurry effects, then it's important to work wet on wet. But once we want to create further details and sharp looking textures and things like that, it's important to allow the previous layer to dry completely. And you have to stay super patient to ensure that you're not damaging your paper. For example, I know when I was first getting started, I thought that I was going to be able to finish an entire painting in one sitting. And don't get me wrong, you can finish a painting in one sitting if you're looking to create the kind of painting that is very loose, expressive, and that doesn't have very much detail, but this isn't what I was going for. I was going over the same area of my paper again and again, completely messing up the values that I had initially created, muddying up my colors, and damaging my paper. And I was super frustrated because I wasn't able to create the details that I wanted to because my paper was still damaged. Damp. I wasn't allowing it to dry. So if you're looking to create any sort of detailed painting, it's very important for you to learn to stay patient, especially because mistakes are very difficult to correct when it comes to watercolor and just the nature of the materials that we're using, like paper for example, tends to be a lot more fragile than say a canvas. And yes, even watercolor paper, which is intended for water-soluble mediums, can only take so much water and so much beading. So many times you have to understand that you have to step back and allow that layer to dry and allow the paper to regain its strength before going back in. Okay, having said all that, I am now getting into the tips that are going to help you better understand how much water slash paint should be in your paint mixtures, on your paper, and in your paintbrush bristles. Let's get started with the paint mixtures themselves. To begin, I activated my paint colors by spraying them with water about 5 to 10 minutes before starting with these explorations. You don't have to necessarily spray it with water, you can go into the pan and just pull the color out with a wet paintbrush though. When I'm creating my paint mixtures, I go straight to the pan with a very wet paintbrush, saturated but not dripping, and I do very light circling motions in the color that I want to pull out, and I bring it over to my color mixing palette. In this case, I am mixing my colors on the palette that came integrated with this Winsor & Newton paint set. In terms of your water to paint ratio, it's really going to depend on whether you want to go right in from the beginning with a very saturated dark color 
or with a light color that has more water in it. Usually watercolor paintings start with light, more translucent colors and get darker and darker as we go forward in the painting process. What I will say is that you definitely want to make sure, unless you're specifically going for a dry brushing effect, that there is a good amount of water in your paint mixture so that when you're applying your paint on your watercolor paper, it gets applied nice and smoothly. And how textured your paper is, is really going to affect how smoothly and evenly your paint is distributed on your paper. For these little tests, I'm working wet on dry, and as you can see, there is a huge difference between my hot press watercolor paper that is a lot smoother when compared to the cold press watercolor paper that has a lot more texture to it. I'm going to be leaving a link to a video that I created a while ago in which I go much more into depth in regards to the different kinds of watercolor paper, hot press, cold press, rough, and also lightweight, midweight, and heavyweight paper because they will all lead to different kinds of painting experiences as well as outcomes. As I was mentioning before, you need to create your color mixtures with a water to pigment ratio depending on the lightness and transparency to darkness or saturation that you're after. For darker values, simply add more pigment and less water. And for lighter values, you're going to want to have less pigment and more water in there. Something that is absolutely essential for me to have by my side when I'm painting with watercolors is a scrap piece of watercolor paper because I always like testing out colors and transparencies before actually placing that paint mixture on my painting. So what I'm showing you right here is probably one of the best exercises that beginners just starting out with watercolors can do in order to practice creating a large variety of values using only one pigment. This exercise also does wonders for you in terms of helping you develop that water control skill, so I highly, highly recommend it. So what I did is I pulled out pigment from my pan onto my paint mixing palette and I added water to this until I created a nice, juicy, but heavily saturated paint mixture. I made sure that my paint mixture was as saturated and dark as I could get it. And then once my paint mixture was ready, I went back into my paint mixture and soaked up all I could by very gently making these circling motions in my little puddle of paint. And once my paintbrush was nice and saturated, what I did was I went straight over to my paper and I painted a square. So next, to create a square in a lighter version of the same color, what I did is I went into my cup of water a couple of times and brought out some water onto my paint mixture. I added more water to my paint mixture to make it more light and transparent. Now, there's no reason to go overboard with this. Simply go into your cup of water, allow your bristles to absorb or soak up some of it, then go back to your palette and mix this water into your paint mixture. Usually doing this anywhere from two to three times is enough to ensure that your color is going to be lightened. Of course, it's going to depend on how much water your paintbrush bristles can absorb and bring over to the paint mixture. And this is going to depend on whether your paintbrush has natural bristles or synthetic bristles and the size of your paintbrush, etc. But I'm going to be talking more about paintbrushes in a bit. But anyway, once this new paint mixture with more water in it is ready, then allow your paintbrush bristles to soak up and absorb as much as they can of this mixture. Now you don't want your paintbrush to be dripping. Saturate your bristles with this new mixture and go straight over to your watercolor paper to draw a second square. Once your second square has been painted, you're gonna go back into your water, bring out more of it into your paint mixture a couple of times or three more times until it appears more watery and lighter. Once you have that new mixture, allow your paintbrush bristles to soak it up once again and go straight to your watercolor paper and draw your third square. You can repeat these steps as much as you'd like to until you arrive at your very lightest value or you run out of space. 
It's really going to depend on the quality of your paint, but notice how at no point in time did I go back and grab more pigment out of my pan. A little paint can go a long way. Okay, so I'm going to do a second version of this exercise, and for this one, I'm going to go from lightest to darkest. For this one, I wanted to use a different color, so I grabbed some orange and brought it over to my paint mixing palette. I tested the consistency of my mixture on a piece of scrap paper, and then I added even more water to it to make it nice and transparent for my first square. And honestly, that first paint mixture that I created is a bit more pigmented than it needed to be. So what I did is I grabbed some paint from the edge of my puddle because my paint mixing palette is sort of curved. As you can see, most of the paint mixture is pulling near the central part of my palette. And so by taking my paint mixture from the very edge where I have less paint mixture, I made sure my bristles would absorb a less amount of pigment. But anyway, for this version of this exercise, as opposed to the first one in which you're adding more water to your mixture in between each square, for this one you're actually pulling more paint into your mixture after each square. I feel this one might be a little bit trickier because you are probably going to have to grab more water to bring it into your pan of paint to reactivate the paint and bring it over to your paint palette. But as long as you're making sure that you're bringing a lot of pigment along with you each time you are incrementing that darkness, you're gonna be fine. Okay, you guys, let's move on to the paper. I am now going to give you some tips that will help you ensure that you don't have too much water on your paper and keep things as much in control as possible. And of course, these tips are mostly for wet on wet techniques in which you are placing new pigment on paper that is already wet. These are the situations that usually cause more trouble because we have less control. I don't recommend any kind of watercolor paper that is less than 140 pounds in weight for any kind of wet on wet techniques. If you use thinner paper than this, you're probably going to have to deal with warping and buckling and it's going to be pretty frustrating. So to begin, it's essential to understand that there is such a thing as having too much water on your watercolor paper. When you're pre-wetting your paper to create wet-on-wet -wet effects, what you're looking for is a nice, even, uniform sheen, not a puddle. So right here you can see that I pre-wetted a little section of my watercolor paper and this is a puddle. This is too much water. If I were to tip my paper a little bit more to the right or to the left, the water would probably run down my page. When our watercolor paper is way too wet and we attempt to place a little bit of pigment on it, sometimes our pigment doesn't expand the way that we want it to or we're left with a very harsh, sharp looking edge around the puddle or there is a certain area that has blotchiness. And generally speaking, it's gonna be very difficult to kind of predict how our paint is going to dry because our paper has such an uneven wetness to it and the water is gonna continue moving around throughout the painting process. Okay, so now I am actually properly pre-wetting a section of my watercolor paper, even since the beginning. Prior to actually going onto my watercolor paper with my paintbrush, I made sure to gently scrape the excess water off from my paintbrush bristles against the edges of my cup of water. I then go over the area again and again to ensure that the moisture is distributed in a uniform way. And this also gives the paper a chance of absorbing it and allowing the water to settle into the paper a little bit before actually going in with my pigment. When I turn this paper towards the light, you can definitely see the uniform sheen that I've created on this new section of my watercolor paper and how it looks very, very different from the puddle of water beside it. Okay, so I'm now going to attempt to drop in a bit of pigment on this new section and see what happens. I can immediately see these beautiful blooms forming and I'm pretty sure they're gonna dry pretty well, but in a couple of minutes, we'll come back to it to check it out. In the meantime, I'm going to show you what I would do if I accidentally dropped way too much water and had a puddle on my paper. 
And what I would do would be to simply lift up and absorb as much water as possible using an old rag or paper towel. And I would allow that section of my paper to dry completely and allow that paper to regain its strength. All right, so in this last section right here, I'm going to show you what a back run is and how to avoid them. A back run happens when you deposit way too much water on paper that is already wet. So right here, I'm taking my time to pre-wet the section of my paper correctly. And then I loaded up my paintbrush bristles with color mixture and went ahead to deposit this pigment on my paper. So now what I'm gonna do to show you what a back run is, is as this paper is still very, very wet, I'm going to load my paintbrush bristles with water. I didn't even take the time to remove the excess water from my bristles by either blotting it on my towel or by doing the scraping method on the edge of my cup or anything. I am just going right into my watercolor paper with a very, very loaded brush. So this is an extreme example, but it's very important to have in mind that a back run can happen pretty much whenever you have a large amount of water already on your paper and you go in with a very saturated brush. So you could do two things if you wanted to go back and modify this first layer of color that you initially placed wet on wet. One of these things is you can allow it to dry completely and go back with a wash afterwards. And another thing you can do is while it's still wet, you could still add in more color, but you have to make sure in these cases that the color mixture that you create is what is referred to as a dry color mixture meaning that it has a lot of pigment in it, but not too much water in it. Now, if a back run happens to you, don't worry, there's still a way to fix it, but you do have to work quickly. There are a couple of things that you could do to minimize this weird splotchy effect. Uh, one of them, for example, could be to just take advantage of the wetness that is already on your paper and go over it with a flat brush or any kind of larger brush to more evenly distribute this pigment. Another thing that you could do is do what I'm doing right here and lift some of the pigment off your paper using a semi-dry brush. Watercolor paintbrush bristles, and yes, even the synthetic kind, like the ones that I like using, are made to absorb water. They soak up water. And so what I do is I take away all of the excess water from my bristles by pressing or squeezing it with my paper towel. And I go into the area of pigment that I want to absorb, allow my bristles to soak up some of that pigment. Then I go back into my paper towel to remove what has been absorbed and repeat this process as many times as I'd like. In order to avoid things like back runs to happen, always ask yourself what's wetter, your paper or your paintbrush? So here are these little experiments a while later. At this point, they are 100% bone dry. You can see these little blooms to the left and how they dried beautifully. On the other hand, to the right, we have the result of the back run or cauliflower. Okay, and finally, we're gonna be talking about paintbrushes because paintbrushes are also a very important part of being able to stay on top of water control. So as I was mentioning before, the amount of water your paintbrush is able to absorb and retain is really going to depend on the type of paintbrush that you're using the shape, the size, the type of bristles, whether you're using natural hair bristles or synthetic bristles or a combination. Usually bristles that are made from natural hair are able to absorb and retain more water. Personally, I always use synthetics for a variety of different reasons that I'm not gonna go into right now. And of course, the size of the brush is also going to affect how much water they're able to retain. Larger brushes are able to absorb and retain more, whereas the smaller brushes are able to absorb and retain a lot less. When it comes to brushes, I think that the main thing that I want to kind of get across right now since the beginning is just the amount of times that I actually remove the excess water from my bristles throughout the painting process. I am constantly removing excess water from my paintbrush bristles 
by either blotting my paintbrush in my paper towel or very gently scraping my bristles along the edge of my cup of water. In fact, personally, I rarely go straight from my paint mixture onto my watercolor paper unless I am deliberately going for the kind of background wet-on-wet -wet effects. And even then, I am very careful not to deposit way too much water on wet paper. So always, always kind of have in mind and keep gauging how much water you have in your paintbrush bristles versus how much water is already on your paper. And if you see any extra dripping from your paintbrush or you see drops of water that have collected in the ferrule, then stop, go back to your paper towel and very gently remove the excess water from either the bristles or the ferrule of your brush. And there are even different amounts of water that can be taken away from the bristles of your brush when you're using a paper towel. Like for example, if you only want to remove a tiny bit of water from your paintbrush because it's too soaking wet, then very simply just very gently touch the tip of your brush to your absorbent towel and this will take away the excess. On the other hand, if you're looking to take away most of the water from the bristles, then you can just go ahead and gently squeeze the entire bristle area with your paper towel. I really cannot emphasize enough how important it is to have a paper towel or a rag next to you when you're painting with watercolor, both for removing excess water that you have accidentally placed on your paper, as well as removing excess water from your paintbrush. And finally, I want to share this very cool exercise with you guys. Doing these kinds of things really helped me understand the amount of water and the amount of pigment that even a paintbrush in this size that I'm using here in this video, which is a size eight round, can hold in its bristles. Just look at how many little leaves I am able to paint with only one load of a brush. Really acknowledge how far one loaded brush can go, even if it doesn't look like it's dripping or sopping wet, and take time to consider if you really have to go back into the paint pan to grab more pigment, or if you really have to go back and get more water to create the effects that you're looking for. This exercise also really helped me realize the beautiful variation in terms of values and transparencies that one color is able to achieve. And it really gives you a feel for how much pigment and water your paintbrush is able to retain. Okay, I really hope that you give these exercises a go. I really feel that they will help you if you haven't tried them already. And don't get frustrated with yourself. I damaged a ton of paper when I was first starting out and ruined a bunch of paintings. And really, when it comes to this kind of thing, it's your own practice and it's through messing up that we are going to learn and develop that skill for water control. With practice and in time, you're going to be doing these things naturally without even thinking about it. All right, you guys, I really hope that you found this video helpful. Please let me know in the comment section below if you have any further questions or any specific topics that you'd like me to expand upon. Or if you're further along, then let us know your own tips so that we can all help each other out. I would really, really appreciate a thumbs up if you found this video helpful because it really helps my channel get in front of more people. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it and talk to you soon. Bye!